Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second webinar in our social network uh, analysis series. Uh, I'm Dermot Mathonnell. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you as well uh, to people who have joined us uh, before. So this training is part um, of our new forms of data uh, training series, um, which is also uh, part of our computational social science uh, training series uh, as well. So we have some upcoming uh, webinars you may be interested in. Uh, the third uh, and final webinar um, of the social network analysis uh, series is on in two weeks time, uh, this time two weeks, uh, where we focus on uh, analysis. So we take the fundamental concepts we learned two weeks ago, uh, take some of the data we're going to collect and explore today uh, and start producing some uh, basic and intermediate level analyses uh, of a social network data set. Uh, alongside this, we've got our um, continuously running coding demonstrations uh, series. Uh, so this month we're focusing on text mining. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Julia Kazmaier has been running this uh, and you can learn how to do some uh, basic, intermediate and advanced uh, text mining uh, in Python. So that's uh, very interesting and free as well. And that's happening. And we've got some past webinars. You can find all these on our events page. Um, these are all on YouTube and there's some further coding and uh, learning resources you can access for free uh, also. But back to today, uh, what we're going to focus on is the collection, the cleaning and the kind of repurposing or the transforming of data so we can conduct some social network uh, analysis. So very briefly, I'll just do a quick refresher on the key concepts. Um, we'll talk about uh, APIs very briefly. So these are the kind of the data platforms through which we get social network uh, information and data. Then we're gonna look at an example. So I'll talk you through the main steps of getting data from Twitter, uh, their API, as well as do a quick coding demonstration um, of making some requests for data and cleaning it up and saving it for later use. We look at social network data from a different perspective, which is looking at data about social networks and connections that exist in a traditional social survey or a traditional administrative data set. So trying to extract relational network information and from data that we're probably very familiar with using uh, in our research uh, and teaching. And then we'll take uh, some questions at the end. Um, you've probably noticed by now, if you've joined us a, no a number of times, um, you can submit questions. Unfortunately, you can't see the questions other people uh, submit. Therefore, I'll go through as many as possible at the end. The ones I don't, um, we'll type up a frequently asked questions and we'll post that as well uh, on our publicly available uh, GitHub uh, repository. So uh, to be concise, why are we doing this, this training series? Um, social network analysis is you know, an enormously interesting and rich approach to social science um, research. But those of you who probably have some experience of it have probably found that it is quite a technical and mathematical um, methodology. So it can be quite um, an, an unwelcoming quite an abstract uh, field of social science methodology. Uh, and the purpose of this training series is to try and simplify and demystify um, social network analysis as a methodology. Um, because once you do, once you get over the technical, um, the technical language and nomenclature, a lot of the uh, analysis and a lot of the data structures are very um, intuitive, very familiar and very, very uh, rich. So it's a good good area to get interested in once we get over that initial technical uh, hump. So a brief refresher on what we're talking about uh, when we say social network analysis. Uh, what it is, as I've probably mentioned, it's a methodology. So it's uh, a methodological and conceptual toolbox. So it's quite broad. Uh, you can approach the analysis of network data from a lot of different perspectives, using lots of different analytical methods, measures, and algorithms, for example. And the purpose of it is allow you to, to describe and to measure and to analyze networks. And networks are composed of patterns uh, in the relational structures in the social uh, world. Relational structures are just simply the connections that exist between entities and how these connections add up to form an overall uh, network. A relation itself is a distinctive type of connection or a tie, as we've been calling it, between two entities. A very common relation, of course, is a familial relation, brothers and sisters, parents and children, aunts and uncles, uh, etc. So that's a particular type of connection. Um, but you can be colleagues with somebody, you can be 
uh, spouses, you can be familiar associates, acquaintances, two companies can share the same office, etc. There's lots of different types of relations in the social world that we're interested in. And these relations or connections are thus the building blocks uh, of networks. And hence social network analysis then is concerned with uh, and most appropriate for uh, the analysis of data capturing relations between your units of analysis. And we've defined units of analysis very broadly. It's social network analysis, so there needs to be some connection um, to sociology or the social world or social research. Um, but social network analysis comes from network analysis. More broadly, uh, your entities can be people, animals, countries, organizations, computers, uh, planets, you name it. Whatever you think can be connected and uh, can form part of your uh, analysis. So the key point is we're interested in how people or things are connected and how these connections form patterns and these patterns form overall networks or aggregations uh, that we can analyze. So in a very, uh, very brief uh, uh, way of describing it, a network, whether we're talking about social, physical, biological, etc., cetera, um, it comes from two main uh, building blocks. So the entities are the things that are or could be connected in a network and the connections that exist or could exist between these uh, entities. So a network is this aggregation or collection of these entities and the connections that exist uh, between them. So again, a family tree is a type of network containing individuals um, that are then connected or related through some type of uh, familial uh, tie. If you joined us for the previous uh, webinar, we had a look at um, you know, a real network. So these are uh, organizations in the UK, specifically charities, and these are the connections that exist between them. So these are Manchester uh, registered charities in the UK. There's about 1,100 of them. Uh, and they're connected if they have somebody who serves uh, as a trustee for both uh, organizations. And typically you see this is the type of visual depiction of a network uh, that is most common in social network analysis. We've got a big you know, clump of charities here in the middle who are quite densely connected. And we've got some charities on the periphery who are only connected to one other uh, organization. So that's a very brief uh, refresher of social networks. We have the previous webinar if you'd like to uh, go through that. But today we're going to focus on uh, getting social network uh, data. And from two perspectives, one from a social media platform, i.e. Twitter, uh, and extracting network data from traditional social survey or administrative uh, data sets. And we'll return to this um, charity example uh, later in the webinar. But first, you need to understand the uh, data infrastructure or the platforms through which you get data about social networks, and uh, particularly from social media uh, platforms. And these are typically known as uh, application programming interfaces, uh, or for short, just simply APIs. So the technical definition of an API is it's a set of functions and procedures uh, allowing the creation of applications that access the features or data of an operating system, application, or other service. That's a very, um, I think, uh, unfriendly definition. It's technically correct. In essence, an API is an intermediary between software applications. So if I design uh, a, soft, a smartphone application and I need real-time traffic data from tra Transport Scotland, for example, um, I could do a lot of hard work of writing programming code in the same language as the database that holds the traffic information, or if it exists, I can use an intermediary that takes a very simplified um, set of instructions and requests, and that itself will go and get the data uh, for me. So APIs are these kind of middlemen or, or intermediaries or translators between one software application or a programming script on one side and a database or some other software application uh, on the other. If the kind of technical definitions aren't, aren't too clear, then really conceptually an API in terms of data uh, is a socket. So basically you plug in your programming script or your smartphone application or your website or whatever it is you have that needs data, you plug that in to the API and the API uh, returns the data uh, to you. So you don't need to know very much about the database, what language the database is written in, what infrastructure it uses, that doesn't matter. The API knows how to get the data and you simply ask the API uh, for the data that you're interested in. And that is a socket in one of my rooms that I painted, so hence it's quite um, a messy uh, job. That's not where my skills uh, lie. 
So a lot of data about social networks or from social media platforms um, come from um, APIs. So you need to uh, learn how to uh, interact with them uh, in order to get your data. So we're going to take an example today. Uh, we're going to use Twitter. Um, I think it's interesting for its, its own sake um, as a source of social network data. Of course, there are many others. Um, Facebook does allow access to its data through an API, but it's become more restrictive. Recently, it's a bit more difficult uh, to use. Um, the same for Instagram, that's really tightened up. Um, but there are some that are more friendly than Twitter also. Spotify is quite a good one uh, to get social uh, network data from as well. Um, and various newspapers as well. So in a previous webinar, we looked at the Guardian API, for example, and you can look at connections between articles in terms of you know topics or resharing or, or hashtags, uh, etc. But today we'll focus on Twitter. It's had a recent upgrade to its API, so it's worth um, delving into some of the uh, details about that. So if you're unfamiliar with what uh, Twitter is um, itself, so it's one of the world's most popular um, social networking platforms. Um, or microblogging, so it's about the sharing of, of kind of brief, concise pieces of text content. But of course, it's much, much broader now. You can share um, videos and images and clips, um, et cetera. So it's got a user base, certainly in the hundreds of millions, um, but it is notoriously tricky to pin down the exact usage of this platform. Uh, Twitter does prevent you from trying to reverse engineer you know, um, details about the platform, how many people use it, um, but we can safely say it's, it's somewhere in the hundreds of millions of unique users per month. So it generates a lot of data about social uh, networks. In terms of usage, uh, users can post, which is known as tweeting, uh, their own content. They can repost uh, or retweet the content of others. They can like the content um, of others, they can follow other users, and there's lots of other functionality you can use um, on the Twitter platform. Uh, and Twitter then allows restricted access to the data it holds um, on the above activities through its API. So Twitter makes voluminous information available, but in terms of you know the proportion of information that it holds, it allows restricted access. So you can't just connect to the Twitter API and get all tweets for one account or all tweets for all accounts that you're interested in. Um, it's just simply not that um, detailed, but it's incredibly detailed and it's almost certainly more than enough for research um, purposes. So what do we know about the Twitter API itself? So it allows programmatic access to the Twitter platform. So in one way that allows you to use Twitter yourself. So to, to tweet and to retweet and to follow other accounts automatically or in a scheduled uh, way. And you've probably heard these referred to as um, bots. So Twitter bots, we've heard the, the nefarious use of Twitter bots in uh, election campaigns and election interfering, uh, unfortunately, in recent years. Uh, in essence, you connect to the Twitter API uh, with some information and you say, anytime somebody follows me, could you automatically um, reply to them saying, thank you very much for following my account. So that would be an example of you connecting to the Twitter API and giving it some instructions to act uh, on your uh, behalf. So that just shows that APIs are much broader than just accessing data. They allow you to access uh, functionality. But today we're going to be interested, uh, and as we usually are for research purposes, um, with getting our hands on data. So we can issue instructions or requests to the Twitter API uh, to get data on certain topics about certain people uh, from certain tweets, uh, etc. And there are different levels of access uh, known as tiers to the API. Uh, in general, there's a standard level of access. Uh, this is free, this is for individual use, uh, and this usage would you know, carry with it the most uh, restricted um, conditions. So there'll be X amount of uh, requests you can make per 15 minutes. There'll be, I think it's 500,000 tweets you can request every 30 day periods. There's restrictions on the sharing of the data that you download, um, et cetera. If your research uh, project carries some funding, you can also uh, upgrade to the premium or you can do it yourself, uh, obviously. Uh, this is still kind of geared towards you know individual use or researcher use um, but you'll get you know much more generous um, restrictions so I don't know exactly but you know it could be 1 million tweets every 30 days instead of 500,000 
um, and maybe it's different different limits per 15 minutes, um, etc. And then there's a, an enterprise version, which just again, you know, if you're an organization and you need access to Twitter data or functionality, you know, as a core um, component of a service offering or a product that you sell, there's enterprise level access um, also. And that's probably something I, I can't imagine you're um, interested in as researchers, but it's just, you know, uh, good for you to be aware uh, of the different levels uh, of access. And in terms of getting your hands on data itself, um, the API provides what are known as endpoints. Endpoints are simply the uh, data tables or the information that you want to uh, request itself. So if you think of you know, a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet can have multiple sheets within it. So maybe sheet one contains user information and sheet two contains uh, tweet information and sheet three contains retweet information, etc. Uh, basically, an endpoint would be sheet one. A second endpoint would be, you know, the second spreadsheet, um, etc. So, an endpoint is the the API kind of technical term for the spreadsheet or the table or the information uh, that you're interested um, in. And endpoints, if you request them uh, manually, they're basically web addresses. So, it'll be something like https um, twitter dot api forward slash tweets. That's not literally what it is, but that's an example of what an endpoint looks like. And if you were to request that web address, um, hopefully, if successful, it would return the data that exists at that endpoint uh, to you. But we'll see how that actually works in a moment uh, with the coding demonstration. Um, just you know, get it into your head that uh, if you ever hear endpoint, it means the kind of data table or the database or the spreadsheet of information uh, that you're interested uh, in. So how do we actually uh, use or interact with the uh, Twitter API? So there are a number of general steps that you go through uh, before you can start requesting uh, data. So there's a registration uh, stage. So basically, you need to set yourself up as a user on the Twitter developer platform or developer portal, uh, as it's also called. Uh, for this, you need a Twitter account uh, and some verified details. Uh, so for me, I need my Twitter um, handle, so my at uh, and my username, uh, plus a verified phone number. And once I have those two things, um, I can start to register on the developer uh, portal. When you use APIs, you the, again the language can be can be quite off-putting. So APIs are traditionally aimed at software developers. So you need some access to, you know, the data or functionality of another platform. And so the API assumes you're a developer who's creating a smartphone application or a website or a you know a digital product or something like that. And um, but a developer platform also you know uh, can be used by researchers. It just means that you basically register yourself with the API, Twitter knows who you are and what you're using uh, the API for. So the API will uh, ask you to um, explicitly create a project uh, and one or more uh, what are known as applications. So again, if I was a software developer, I would you know, create a project name, so um, whatever the project could be. And then under that project, I might have three or four different smartphone applications um, that are related. For you as a researcher, you might create a project which is the name of your, your paper or your research um, study. Uh, and then the application might just be simply something specific like um, getting you know, tweets to do with um, Brexit, for example. Uh, you have a lot of freedom in terms of what you write. Twitter is not looking for certain projects or for certain keywords. Um, but you do need to be uh, explicit and you do need to be upfront about why you want to use the Twitter uh, API. Then once you get accepted as a developer and your project gets approved, uh, this can take, I've heard you know, nightmare stories of two, three weeks. Uh, for me, recently it took about eight hours to be approved uh, to do uh, some uh, requesting of data from the Twitter API for research purposes. And um, so if you want to do things this afternoon, you've probably left it too late, but Surely, um, if you give it a day or so, uh, Twitter will accept your application. And once you're accepted, basically Twitter says, okay, here's your username, here's your password, uh, and in some cases, here are some secret keys that you need to provide when requesting certain types um, of data. So these are known as authentication keys or credentials. 
And these basically allow the Twitter API to recognize that it is you using uh, the API at a given time. Uh, then you select your level of access. So do you want you know, the standard version or do you want to pay for, for um, premium uh, or the enterprise version? And the more interesting bit is thankfully then you can start requesting data. Uh, these kind of general steps um, apply to lots of other uh, social media platform and just APIs um, in general. So it's worth recognizing that you can't immediately use a lot of APIs. There's a registration process. You tell them explicitly what the use case is uh, of your project. You get some username and password credentials uh, and you select what level of access uh, you would like. So I have a, a little uh, video here that we can just kind of uh, move through um, a wee bit. So this is what the Twitter developer um, portal looks like. So you go to uh, the Twitter uh, developer portal, you click uh, register for an account. It asks you what type uh, of user you are. So, you know, are you professional developing software products? Are you an academic, um, et cetera? So you can see then it tries to pick up, you know, my information. So this is my uh, Twitter account that I have anyway. I have a verified phone number and, um, you know, my email address, where do I live? Um, et cetera, um, oops, uh, and we can um, move on uh, from that. Uh, and then, yeah, so we just give them some information and this is the key uh, kind of section uh, here. So here is where we're registering our use case. What do we actually want to use um, Twitter for um, itself? So basically, Twitter asks for you know about a paragraph's worth of information uh, on why you want to use the Twitter API. So I you know I don't try and fudge this or lie or hide what I'm doing. I'm quite you know explicit. My research interests you know are to do with UK charities. Uh, some of you probably realise that by now. So I'm saying I want some Twitter API data, and um, so I can track a, the kind of the solicitation for donations by uh, charitable organisations. And so then we've got a, a set of specific questions. So, you know, are you just actually hoarding data? Are you going to analyze it? And I say, yes, I'm going to classify um, responses uh, to calls for donations, you know, as positive, neutral, um, or negative, for example. Um, so, yeah, and then there's some questions about, you know, um, do you need to use any of the functionality? So am I downloading data um, or, uh, do I want to actually create a bot myself? So after I download data, I do some analysis and then my account starts actually posting the findings of my research, um, for example. Uh, so I write an, an answer to that. Um, I fill all these, these uh, fields out. There are four fields. It's, it's not too onerous. It takes about five minutes um, to fill out, for example. And um, yeah, and then do you plan to share data or do you plan on you know, releasing data uh, that you collect. Uh, very often this is not the case, though maybe sometimes if a journal wants the actual underlying data itself, maybe, you know, you have cause to share it. Um, in this example, I, I decided to play it safe. I said, look, when I do the aggregate analysis of tweets, um, I'll be probably sharing that data set um, and I'll be obviously reporting the findings uh, in some academic um, papers. So you get a chance to look over your answers very quickly and um, you sign up to the developer policy. So these are, you know, the, the restrictions and the, the fair use of the Twitter API. It's usually standard, um, you know, digital product um, kind of use cases and terms and conditions. Uh, but things to look out for if you read the developer policy would be, um, yeah, the sharing of information. So you're not allowed to share data you download with government departments, for example. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem, but I have had someone contact me saying, well, do universities count? Uh, they don't, but, you know, there may be certain institutions, maybe you're seconded somewhere and you do some researches in Twitter data and they want it. Uh, but in general, the, de the developer policy is, you know, um, uncontroversial uh, for research uh, purposes. So we've done a registration, we've gotten set up. Twitter API knows, you know, who I am. So let's actually um, dig into uh, the data itself. Uh, so some of you will be familiar if you've joined us before, and um, we tend to use these Python notebooks uh, where we can mix, 
you know some text and we can make some some programming code uh, also uh, this is available in the uh, repository link that we sent you uh, previously and it'll be sent uh, to you in a couple of days um, also so for now you don't need to follow along I'll just be doing a very brief coding demonstration um, but if you'd like to have a more in-depth coding demonstration we do have these continuously running series uh, so in the feedback to today if you if you feel like a social network coding demonstration series would be good and um, then please let us know it's something um yeah, it's something we love to do so let's take a look uh, so i've registered with the twitter api uh, recently and um, that's why i recorded that video because i don't need to do that process again i'm an approved uh, quote unquote developer on the twitter api um, uh, platform so let's take a little look through uh, what we can do now that we are um, registered. So anytime we use Python, we need to just configure it correctly. And um, so we need these um, uh, Python modules or Python uh, packages uh, here. So we run this code uh, that loads in everything we need uh, for Python. Uh, and now we can get going with the um, requesting of uh, data. So when I register for the Twitter API, it gave me a unique username, a unique password, uh, and a couple of secret keys, which sometimes are necessary for requesting um, certain types of data, maybe more sensitive or more you know, confidential data. You need to also provide um, a secret uh, key. A kind of childish, but actually a useful analogy is to think of like having a tree house and you know, having a password and a, a, us a, a username and a password and like a secret word to get into the, the tree house that um, surprisingly worked uh, for me. So just to show you what your credentials tend to look like, these are fake credentials because obviously these are um, specific to you and are actually reasonably confidential if someone got your details, uh, started making, you know, very you know rapid or spurious or, or malicious attempts at requesting data you would be uh, kicked off the twitter uh, platform so uh, we won't actually um be sharing any of our, our details today but when you do eventually um uh, when you do eventually register yourself then uh, you will have your own credentials and you can swap them in uh, here so for example you know, these are my credentials, I've made this up, you know, my username is, is this and my password is that. And there's some extra secret keys that sometimes I might need to uh, use. So I'm gonna uh, load in my own credentials. It's good practice when you're, when you're doing this to keep your credentials in a separate file. Uh, and that way you load in the details you need. So there, you know, I'm never writing my username, you know, as a string in here, for example, um, it's always uh, protected. So I'm going to load in my own um, uh, credentials. And just again, if you're going to use this code um, yourself at a later date, uh, you must you know, supply your own credentials. Uh, I unfortunately can't share mine with you. So we've gone and we've, we've taken our credentials from wherever they are on our laptop or on our Dropbox or iCloud or, or what have you. Now we're going to connect to the API and the first step is to tell it uh, who uh, we are. So we're going to use um, a Python package or module called uh, Tweepy. Or Tweepy, I'm not sure. I'm guessing it's Tweepy. Uh, I prefer Tweepy. Um, this basically provides a very kind of uh, simplified and easily understood way of using the Twitter API. So basically, uh, Tweepy, you know, saves you writing lots of code yourself. So when you want a certain data set, there's an easy way of doing this using Tweepy, for example. So for actually telling the API who uh, we actually are, we can use um, a method here. So we tell Tweepy, okay, this is my uh, username, this is my password, um, and then connect to the API using these um, credentials. So we do that. So we haven't asked for any output, that's why you're not seeing any. Basically, if you don't get an error, you've successfully connected uh, to the Twitter uh, API. To check if it's actually uh, working, we can make an example request to the API. Uh, so we're gonna do a, a search request um, and we're gonna look for my uh, first name, uh, Dermid, and we're gonna find the first 10 results. Uh, and then we're gonna look at the content of the uh, tweet um, itself. Uh, so we can run this uh, in real time. Um, so you can see I get, uh, for some reason, lots of um, Japanese results, which is quite interesting. I think there's, 
an anime or a manga character who has my first name, which is quite strange because I have a very Irish first name, but apparently uh, it's a character uh, also. So these are the first 10 um, results. Uh, and you can see the, the kind of results um, are done in real time. So maybe they don't change uh, that quickly, but anytime there's a new um, uh, tweet mentioning my name, uh, it'll appear here in this um, list. Okay, so we've you know gotten the credentials, we've passed those on to the Twitter API. Let's actually get stuck into getting uh, some uh, data. So one of the first requests you'll uh, tend to make is to get the kind of metadata associated um, with an account. So as you can see, you can get quite a lot of metadata just to do with um, my Twitter account. Uh, so basically it gives you kind of a list of my recent tweets and my kind of biographies. So you can see my screen name here. You can see where I've said I'm based. Um, you can see my you know, job title that I've put up there. Um, I've got some links to some web pages, uh, how many people follow me, you know, uh, how many um, friends count. I'm not sure what friends count means actually. Uh, I don't think friend is a name or a term used by Twitter, but um, anyway, it's a metadata field that we can get. Um, you can see what I've done recently. So there's something I did today at quarter to 11. Um, I retweeted someone else, uh, unfortunately, about Brexit, which is which is exercising me uh, at the moment. So a very easy, quick um, request you can make to the Twitter API is for your own actual information. Um, you can request any publicly available uh, account. So here's Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom's uh, Twitter account. And again, we can pick out the same uh, information. So how he describes himself um, and his recent uh, activity should be down here as well. Yeah. So at quarter past three, uh, yep, yeah, he tweeted something about uh, criminal sentencing. So uh, even just a simple request like this for, you know, the kind of metadata associated with an account, and, um, you know, captures some of the content and it captures, you know, uh, interesting descriptions about the account um, itself. And there's lots of different uh, methods for requesting data that TweePy provides. So um, there are links elsewhere in this notebook uh, to the full list of kind of data and things that you can request through the API. Um, let's give ourselves some focus just now. Let's pick um, a UK charity. Uh, let's take its Twitter account. Let's get as many tweets as possible as we can get. Um, and then we'll save it for future analysis, you know, which would be um, looking at solicitations for donations and how people uh, responded. So today we'll focus on the, the Royal National uh, Lifeboat, Lifeboat Institution, more uh, commonly known as the RNLI. Um, very valuable uh, in terms of the work it does. Um, UK charity, it does some excellent international work as well. Uh, and it focuses on, well, saving lives uh, around British and international uh, coasts. Uh, so in my opinion, a very, very worthy uh, charitable organization. So one of the methods I can use for getting uh, data is the user timeline method from TweePy. And that gives me the 20 uh, most recent tweets um, or retweets uh, associated with the RNLI um, uh, account. Uh, so I can run this now in real time. You probably just saw previously there were there were older results from about about an hour and a half ago when I previously ran this, um, but uh, we can run it in real time uh, as well. So it gives us quite a lot of fairly difficult to parse um, kind of uh, results. Um, but actually what we're really interested in is there's a field called underscore JSON equals, and then pretty much everything inside of this is the content and the metadata that we want. So its most recent tweet was at a quarter past three in the afternoon today. And um, here's the unique ID of that uh, tweet. Uh, and here's what they posted. So what would you say to rescuers that saved your life? Um, here's the moment that Amanda, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then a link associated um, with the tweet. Uh, there's also information about any hashtags associated with that tweet. Um, you can see that there were no hashtags uh, included with this tweet just here, um, but there usually are, uh, and that information is captured um, also. And there's some fields, it's difficult to see, um, but there's some fields capturing uh, if users were tagged in the tweet. So if the tweet was deliberately 
posted uh, to somebody else or included somebody else, we can see uh, who it was aimed at. And here, now we can start to see the, the social network aspect. And we're just not you know, asking for text back from Twitter. We're also getting a sense of who's interacting with the text, you know, who's the, the tweet or the content directed at, who responds. Uh, we can start building up the network uh, using this uh, information. Uh, we can, you know, pick out the fields that we're interested in, so we can kind of, you know, reduce the the mess and the kind of the uh, difficult to parse results, and we can pick out some fields that we're interested in. Uh, so for the 20 most recent uh, tweets by this charity, um, tell me what date uh, they posted the tweet and give me the actual content um, of the tweet um, itself. Uh, so here, you know, um, it's. There we go. So we're picking up uh, a tweet from half two today. And um, this is one I just read out actually, maybe that's been retweeted by somebody. Um, here we've got then one 15 minutes before that. Uh, again, uh, here's the content uh, of the uh, tweet. So now we're seeing how we can pull out you know, really interesting information um, from the Twitter uh, API. So one issue is that the Twitter API, as most APIs uh, do, uh, they restrict the number of results that are returned. So the user timeline uh, method gives you the 20 most recent. This is to stop you saying, right, give me all tweets by you know this account. If we take somebody like uh, the president of the United States who tweets, I'm not sure, but dozens and dozens of times per day, that can be hundreds of thousands of tweets. And um, if all of us were working on this project now, we're all sending the same request for the tweets from the same account, uh, and that puts a lot of strain on the Twitter API. So APIs in general try and restrict the number of results. That doesn't mean you can't get um, more than 20, it just means for each individual um, request, it only gives you back 20 at a time. So TweetPy gives you a, a way of overcoming this using a cursor method. Um, we don't have to worry too much about how that works now, but in, in future we can do more technical demonstrations. Um, but using this approach, um, and it'll take probably about 10 or 20 seconds. This will go back in time and not just give me the 20 most recent tweets by the RNLI, but it'll actually go back, I think I think the restriction is about 3,200 um, tweets that it can recover. Uh, and then that hard limit of 3,200, I think maybe that extends if you pay for the premium version. Uh, and certainly if you had the enterprise uh, version, that would, um, you know, probably greatly increase the number of tweets uh, that you can uh, recover. But this shows how you need to start thinking um, strategically about your uh, data collection. So if you had a programming script that ran once a month and collected the 3,200 most recent tweets, uh, and then you had that run every month, then you could see over a year how you probably wouldn't miss uh, out uh, on much information. Yeah, so if we look at the, um, Oh, slight typo there. So if we look at the um, results, so we can see that there are 3,200 uh, tweets that we've managed uh, to recover. And if we look at the first um, tweet that we recovered, again, here's the one from half past two. We've seen that a number of times. Uh, here's its ID, here's the text, uh, any hashtags, there weren't any, any links that were shared in the tweet we, we've captured. Um, and then we've got metadata about the account uh, itself. So Twitter gives you back voluminous information. Um, so there really are no excuses of, you know, not having rich enough data. Uh, you'll definitely get um, lots of good data. Uh, so I ran this earlier. You can see I bumped into a uh, slight uh, mistake. So let's, I'd like to call that a deliberate mistake. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. Basically, I'm working through the full list of results that I produced, and I just want three fields. I want the date the tweet was posted, the unique ID of the tweet, and the content of the tweet um, itself. And I can store that into a separate list of results. And here I have now, for each tweet, its date, its ID, and the content uh, it contains. So that's really good. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to you know, save all of those results so we can analyze it later. Um, so I can take uh, the data that I've requested, and I can spit that out uh, to a file uh, on my uh, machine. Um, if you think the data, you know, structure that we've seen, which is, you know, squiggly brackets, and it's, you know, like a field name and then a comma and then the field value is a bit um, 
a bit uh, unfriendly, we can convert the data to something we're more familiar with, um, what we would call a data frame in R, or you know, just a, a, a variable by case matrix, or a, just a regular data set where every row is an observation, you know, and every column is a variable, and every cell is a value for that um, variable. So we can sample from that. We can see, you know, tweet number 1733 was posted on uh, the 18th of April this year. It's unique ID here and the content uh, of the uh, tweet. And then we can save that as well. So we can save to a CSV file um, that kind of more traditional uh, data um, structure. So that's a very uh, quick uh, look at requesting data from the Twitter um, API. Um, you can work through this notebook uh, yourself. There's a bit more information and context to what we're doing that you can read through um, and you can execute this code online yourself as well if you have your own uh, Twitter um, credentials. So in summary, again, uh, there are general steps and approaches that we can, we can extract from what we've just uh, done. Um, so let's take a look at those major steps that you can um, employ for your own um, use of the Twitter API. So you need to register for a Twitter um, API developer um, account. And once you do, as I've shown, you create a project or an application as it's called um, that requires use of that API. Again, it's unless you're doing something very, hesitate to use the word dodgy, but something suspect, you know, and you're trying to hide it as academic work. I mean, if you just honestly describe your research paper, your research project and what you need the data for, um, it'll almost certainly get approved. It's just the process looks uh, a lot more intimidating uh, than it uh, is. But Twitter wants people using their Twitter API. I mean, that's the, that's the point of it. Then we can use the, the TweePy uh, Python package um, for interacting with the Twitter API. This is just you know, a very simplified, uh, friendly set of, of methods and approaches uh, for interacting with the Twitter API and it saves you writing a lot of Python code yourself. Similar packages exist if you use the R programming language. Um, I'm totally agnostic whether you use R or Python. I don't think one is better than the other. It's just your um, personal preference. But of course you can still use Python to collect data and R to analyze data. I think that's a, a sensible um, disaggregation of, of workflow. But you could do the whole thing in R, the whole thing in Python. It's completely up to you. So once you have your account and you have your credentials, um, you can use TweePy then to connect to the Twitter API. And we saw how to do that. We can make various requests um, for data. We can clean you know, the data that comes back and we can save it out for later um, analysis as well. So that's um, a look at how we would uh, interact with the Twitter API. Um, of course, relational data or social network data can exist in other data sets. Um, also, so this very quick example is going to show you um, some traditional administrative data that happens to have information about how charities are connected. And I'll demonstrate a couple of kind of clever, neat tricks um, for converting that into uh, social network um, uh, data. So again, we just load in the uh, packages that Python needs to work with data and to work with network data. Uh, so what I do is I load in some data that I have about the uh, trustees of charities in Manchester. This is all publicly available information, hence why I'm, I'm you know, happy to show um, you know, individual names and actual company numbers, uh, charity numbers right here. So if we take the first uh, individual, um, this person here uh, is on the board of three different charities, and here are the unique um, IDs. So if we conceive of a connection between charities as sharing a trustee, we can see that this this and this charity, uh, these are all connected through this one um, individual. So this data set contains relational information on how charities in Manchester are uh, connected. So now our challenge is to you know, extract this information so we have a data set that contains uh, information about the connections between these uh, organizations. So how do we do that? How do we take out um, this information uh, from the data set. So we define what we want at the end. So if you joined us last week, we just we defined something called an adjacency uh, matrix. Um, this is simply a data set where every row um, is an entity or a node as it's called. 
uh, every column in the data set is also that same uh, set of nodes. Um, and then every cell in the data set or in the matrix um, basically tells you whether those two nodes are connected um, or not. So to give that a bit more um, uh, content, in our example, uh, every row in this data set um, represents a charity. Every column also represents the same set of charities. Uh, and then in each cell would be uh, a one or a zero indicating whether those two charities uh, were connected. Yeah, and we'll see what that looks like uh, in just uh, a short moment. So how do we create um, an adjacency uh, matrix as it's called? Well, the way to conceptualize of what we're doing is basically we want a cross tabulation of all those charity numbers that we saw. So a cross tabulation is just, you know, uh, how many times do we see, um, you know, two categories uh, occur, you know, at the same time. So how many people are both male and employed, for example. So we can cross tabulate our charity numbers as well to see how many times charity A um, occurs with charity B. So how many times are these two uh, charities uh, connected? So the data trick basically is to merge the data set um, with itself. And having done that, um, we can see what the results uh, look like. So on the left is our original data set. So here we can see you know, the first trustee that we have uh, and the three charities that this person uh, is a trustee of. And when we merge the data set with itself, what you see is we're basically replicating uh, the charity numbers um, each uh, time. So we're looking at every possible combination of these three charity numbers for this individual. So we can see that, you know, um, we have this charity uh, here, it's connected uh, to itself, which is um, obvious, but also not very revealing. Uh, this charity is also connected to this one and this one. Uh, and again, you know, this charity is connected to this, uh, et cetera. So the cross tabulation then of this information um, basically gives us our adjacency uh, matrix. So now we have a new data set. This data set has uh, for its rows every charity number. Uh, every column represents the same set of charities. Uh, and in each cell represents how many times these two charities uh, are connected. Uh, so this charity is connected to itself uh, twice. So that means uh, there are two you know, trustees on this chart uh, that shares two trustees in common. Again, that you know, it doesn't make sense that a charity is connected to itself and we'll deal with that. Uh, shortly. Um, but if we take this charity here and this one here, you can see that they share one trustee in common. So charity A maybe has 10 people on the board, charity B maybe has 15. Um, and of those total 25 people, you know, one person is on the board uh, of both uh, organizations. And again, how this is done exactly in Python, if you'd like, we can do more involved coding demonstrations. Um, but I'm just trying to get you to think of the kind of the general um, trick or the general process of going from a traditional data set, which has some relational information into a network data set uh, and what it actually um, looks like. Uh, so there are a couple of other kind of uh, things, you know, we can look at. So as I said previously, this charity and this one are connected. Um, and they're connected through two different uh, trustees. So Charity X and Charity Y basically have two trustees uh, in common. So before I show the final result and, and we move back to taking uh, some questions, um, I want to remove what are known as self loops. So it makes no sense to say a charity shares trustees with itself. That is just self-evidently obvious. Um, so we want to get rid of those um, self loops as they're known in social network analysis. Uh, and I want to convert to what are known as binary relations. So I'm not interested in how many trustees are shared in common. I just want to know, do they share trustees in common? Yes um, or no. And there's two approaches to doing that. So basically I fill uh, the new data set. So all of the values on the diagonal I set to zero. So these are all the, the connections, uh, the self loop connections. Uh, and then anywhere I find a value that's greater than or equal to one, um, I replace that with a value one. So if two charities had 10 trustees in common, now once I make this change, that'll just appear as a one, that they do share at least one uh, trustee in common. 
that's a lot of talking. It makes it a lot easier just to look at the results uh, that are produced. So again, I've removed all the self loops. So if you work down through this diagonal, uh, that captures how charities are connected to themselves. That used to have a value two. I've now replaced it with the value uh, zero. So no connection exists between a charity and itself. Uh, you'll remember as well that this value used to be two. So these two charities uh, share two trustees in common. I'm not interested in the amount. I just want to say yes or no, uh, are they um, connected? And once I do that, um, I've got my you know, uh, network data set known as an adjacency matrix. Um, I can put that into my network analysis software in Python, and then I can start uh, doing some uh, analysis. So there are 1,100 charities, there's 1,500 connections between them, and on average, a charity is connected to three um, others. Uh, so then you can see uh, how we can go forward. We can do more uh, in-depth analysis, which is what we're going to cover uh, in two weeks' um, uh, time.